what Hemingway once said when asked by somebody why his books were so easy to read. He said, it's easy to read because it was hard to write. I grew up in a standard English middle class home, as I think was quite common at the time, where there probably wasn't very much discussion of religion. There was quite a lot of religion at school, but I don't recall it ever coming up at home, and I don't think we would, for instance, generally go to church during the school holidays. But on the other hand, we would have religious services every day at school. The formal renunciation, the Bible burning incident, I suppose I must have been 15. It's a moment when you start wanting to be separate from your parents, and therefore you separate yourself, of course, from a lot of the things that your parents stand for or you think that they stand for, and from, in my case, most of the adults who'd up until then influenced your life. So I had my life taken up with a pretty detailed and demanding secular faith. Uh, I didn't have any shortage of things to believe in. And then after that, I tried, as many former Marxists do, to make my peace with a world which I increasingly realized didn't need to be overthrown by revolution. Well, I was originally a journalist because I was a revolutionary socialist and I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to serve the cause of the revolution by, uh, by getting into journalism and using my position in, uh, in newspapers to promote the revolutionary cause. And then I changed my mind. The moment you, you then go out into, in, into what might be called the normal world, and are dealing every day with, uh, particularly in my case, it would have been police officers, fire brigades, and the kind of people who, who news reporters are constantly talking about, realizing that they were not, they were not like me, they didn't believe what I believed, uh, that they were people who I'd previously in, in many ways despised or seen as figures of, of useless or pointless authority, and they, they weren't. And then you, you, you began to put together, uh, or rather not to be able to put together any more uh, the, the things which you thought and the things which you experienced. And the terrifying thing about beginning to change your mind is that there is no stopping. It is metaphorically like falling through a floor which suddenly gives way beneath your feet and falling so fast that when you hit the floor below that gives way beneath you as well. And huge numbers of things which you not questioned and not thought to be open to question suddenly become questionable. This is uh, some hideous uh, symbol of Mother India, uh, somewhere outside Bombay. The people behind me are bathing in the Ganges, guys in uh, downtown Havana. If it weren't for the sunshine and the rum, I think they'd all go mad. Uzbekistan, one of the new dictatorships which has sprung up since the Soviet Union. This is the Islamic University of Dioband. This is Moscow. This is the new rebuilt uh, Cathedral of Christ the Saviour. That's me in the Shwedagan Pagoda. That's some British troops just outside the green zone in Baghdad. A defaced Saddam Hussein. The Mandalay Rangoon Express pausing at a small town in the middle of Burma. And they make jokes about the regime. And I won't say they're the most terrific comedians I've ever heard, but they're some of the bravest people I've ever seen. Being a conservative journalist has, its, has many joys. Uh, not least you can write things other people uh, can't write and won't write. You can get closer to the truth because conservatives do. But on the other hand, in Britain particularly, you get a lot of derision and personal mockery and abuse from people who would rather do that than argue with you. If you don't like arguments and, and uh, intellectual combat, then don't join. But if you, if you can take it and, and get any pleasure out of it, it'll help. After a while, you learn to take pleasure in being derided uh, and, uh, and, and sneered at and generally treated as if you were the lowest of the low. But the real purpose is, is to try and change the general state of opinion and also things so that the world can be changed for the better. I think it's important to say that atheism led me to faith because so many people view atheism as the final station on the railroad. That you arrive there, that you've been through everything else, that the argument is finished, and that you have permanently rejected something which is restricted really to the childhood of mankind. You can actually see from where I sit that far from being the end of the argument, it's the beginning of the argument. The story goes like this. There we were, a good lunch inside us, my then girlfriend, now my wife and I, wandering around the lovely town of Bone in the middle of Burgundy in France. 
Looked at the guidebook and it recommended particularly a work of art. Went to look at it thinking, oh, another religious painting. And it was a painting of The Last Judgment by a man called Roger van der Weyden. And to my astonishment, the layers of time and distance which normally lie over old paintings were stripped away because the people in it were actually people just like me and the people I knew. And the shock of seeing this plunged me into a whole train of thought from which I have yet to escape. That is to say, the realization of something that I'd always been taught and had for many years rejected, that I might myself be judged. I lived in the dying years of the Soviet Union in Moscow. I traveled extensively in the regions run by communism. I saw it and I know how very, very hostile it was to religion and why it was. And one of the things I want to communicate to people is how that hostility is now being reforged by new atheists who in many cases have no idea of the forces they're trying to summon out of the ground and very little idea of the dangers of what they're doing. If you drive God out of the world, then you create a howling wilderness. There is, as it were, a Hitchens brand. Brothers are brothers. You are, you got them whether you want to have them or not. My poor father tried to get us to sign a peace treaty. But this book has come about because my brother wrote a book attacking God, and Christianity and religion in general. There is an argument to be had. There are things that he says that are wrong. If he wants to write about Henry Kissinger, then that's fine by me. I don't know or actually care very much about Henry Kissinger. But he doesn't know any more about God than I do. Thinking what I think and believing what I believe, that I would hope that my brother would change his mind. I make very limited claims for myself. I travel the world. I try and keep up with events. If somebody says, have you read such and such, and I haven't, I'll say, no, I haven't read it. I would think that most educated atheists are much more likely to be suddenly ambushed in the heart by poetry than they ever are likely to be converted by reasoned argument. A lot of what is, uh, of what is conveyed by Christianity has to be conveyed in this form because, because words, even the most beautiful words, can't fully convey it. The arts, which have always had most effect on me, these things are, are, are immensely potent. I think that, that if people are exposed to them, then they may find that the, uh, the still small voice is audible. Young students sometimes write and say, well, what, what do I need to do to be a journalist? And I always say, just before you do anything else, read Orwell's essay on politics in the English language as the absolute foundation of how anyone should, should approach writing plainly about the truth. This country ceased to be truly Christian in terms of people genuinely, consciously, and in an educated way believing in the Christian faith after the First World War. People still continue to behave as if they're Christians. The society continues to function as if it's a Christian society for some time after it's gone. We've been living in the past 40 or 50 years in the afterglow of Christianity, but eventually, eventually the darkness falls.